And I thought it was remarkable this morning as I was meditating again on this passage, how the uh, way that having been through all the trauma of being threatened, you know, what it's like to be threatened, and uh, that threatening, instead of uh, them feeling sorry for themselves or going and asking for a bit of pity from their fellow believers, it says very beautifully, they went back to their own. Isn't it good to belong somewhere? That's, they, I belong to them and they belong to me. We own each other. And that is what the Church of Christ is made up of, people who own each other. And uh, it's a part of our training. We need each other. You can't continue on into the depths of what God has got for us as believers unless we have one another as well, because we're one body in Christ. Well, they went back home to the rest of the company of God's people at that time. It wasn't very large yet, running into a few thousand, but uh, they I don't know whether they were still gathering in the temple courts. That would have given them a bit of room, but it'd be hard to find enough room together uh, for every single one of them. But nonetheless... That was their immediate reaction. If you haven't got a, a home, if you haven't got a group, of, uh, a, a group of people you can call your own, then you, you are going to miss out a great deal in what God wants in your life and what it means to be a servant of our Lord Jesus. And we heard that um, as they went to meet with their own, they all burst into praise. Now, I think it was supernatural. I think the Spirit of God just moved them, just touched their hearts, and they couldn't hold back. And here they were, Peter and John, they were back from the threatenings and from the officials, all the officials, the Sanhedrin, all the elders who had met together to frighten them. Uh, I don't know whether you've uh, uh, had the misfortune of going on trial into, the, into um, some court, but it's always a court, it was all meant to be a bit threatening, isn't it? And that's why they put on funny wigs and wear robes, and you feel, oh, goodness, I'm in trouble here. And um, that's what they were trying to do, threatening them by the way they dress, by the way they look, and that was the way that uh, they hoped to put fear into the disciples to stop them. They wanted to stop them preaching and talking about Jesus. And when I say to you, be quiet, don't preach in Jesus' name, everything is built together in a law court to make you feel threatened. Well, here were the chief priests, the elders, and the rest of them, and they came away from that, obviously feeling a little bit um, released, and uh, then the church had been praying for them, no doubt, they all burst together and they begin to worship God, the Creator. It's a wonderful phrase they have here. They use the word in verse 24. Oh Lord, oh, that's, um, you can hear the English equivalent. I don't say it's exactly the same in English, but it's the word despote, it's a, des a despot. And uh, it's the final word about everything. God is the final word about everything. And so they call him Lord here, despot. Oh, despot, is this you who um, did make the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is therein? Who, and then they go on to add, who by your Holy Spirit, um, you spoke through David your prophet. So God is a speaking God and he is a making God. He is a creator God. God the creator. And the, the thanks they were giving at this stage was with the verse that already had been penned way back in the Old Testament. And they were talking to that God who made the heavens and the earth and the sky and the sea and everything that's in it. And they were, they were not talking to an idol or a mini idea or some tiny thing. They were talking to the almighty God, the despot of power.
power throughout the whole of the universe. And they were giving thanks to him. And that is the way to grow in love with God and in love with each other, as they were already demonstrating they had that love to some degree. Isn't it wonderful when a company of people can really love one another? That's what the church was always meant to be. I'm sure some of you say to me, well, you've not been to my church, or, or uh, there are churches around who are not like that. And yes, it's true. But that is what a real church is. It's made up not by my attempts to be a nice guy, and everybody can like me, and so we can be nice together. It's made up of the supernatural activity of God, and it is his Holy Spirit that joins us together with the glue of his supernatural love, that God loves me, and God loves my next door. And I'm looking around the group here, but that would let you know who's here this morning. And that brings us together, and that's why we're all longing to see the end of all this shutdown business, isn't it? We love being together because God's love is on each one of us. And then we learn how to worship together. And the Spirit of God was leading them. They might have had words that they'd learnt way back in the past. Well, of course, obviously the New Testament guys did. They'd learnt these words, Psalm 2, from the Old Testament days. And they were using that as a kind of a, a way of speaking the same words at the same time together, rather than just a lot of a, everybody saying everything and anything, and you can't hear what it is. They used what had already been a worship kind of pattern, a worship um, statement that David made. And they said it again, because they saw it fitted exactly into where they were. For it speaks about something which is something we all regret. It says, speaks about anger and rage. It's the raging against God. But we'll see that as we move on. It's the fundamental question in the universe. Why do the nations rage? Why are they furiously coming together? That's how there are different ways of translating, you'll see in different versions. And it's that furious rage that is being mentioned here. Why do people rage? Why do they rage against one another? Why do nations rage? Why are they always fighting and putting, trying to put one another down? Why is the world like it is? Why can't it be a happier place? Deep down you feel it ought to be a happier place. And it's that question I want to just to remind you of this morning. Nations fighting against nations, unhappiness, bitterness, pain all over the world. Why couldn't have God made it otherwise? If he had made us a lot of automatas who had to do what we were made to do rather than choosing to do it, wouldn't it be a lot simpler? Yes, but it wouldn't be producing men and women who are becoming like Jesus. It needs people who can choose to be people who can be lovers. And God is after lovers because he is a lover and he wants somebody like himself to uh, express that love. Of course, he loves every thing that he's made, but he wants some communion, love communion, loving fellowship with creatures that he's made. And so they start off by worshipping the Creator God. And as they worship the Creator God, they all fall in with one another, and they all use this psalm, it was a cry in the Old Testament, why do the nations rage against one uh, and so on. And it's the cry in the New Testament as well. It's the cry of the whole human race for of all time. Why do the nations rage? Well, I'm going to give you the answer this morning. It isn't because one nation is better than another or one has more than another. That does upset people, but it ought not. We ought to be content with what it is that we're born into and what we've got and what we haven't got. 
in the final analysis, why do the nations raise, uh, rage? It's because they're raging against God. That's where the anger is being pitied. We are trying to throw off. Let us cast our bands asunder, it says, our bonds. We feel that we have bonds upon us and we want to throw them off. Well, the only bonds that God in, uh, has to have is the bond of love and it's the bond of he has made us. And if he made us, we belong to him. We, he owns us and uh, he gives us the opportunity to own him and that we can be together. Now that is the position that we're in as creatures. And the answer to is why do we, why do the nations, why do the Gentiles, nations, why do they rage? Why are they continuously, furiously agitating together? Why are they trying to throw off their bonds it's because not they're fighting against uh, this injustice here and that injustice there which is what most of the time we make out that we're doing and it's um, it's that we're raging against God himself deep down the whole universe is on a war setting we're on kind of uh, what do they call it war alert um, to fight and to be angry and agitated. That's where all this anger comes from. It's not just road rage or any other rage, it's anger. And that anger is emanating from the very fact that we are against God. And that is what God is reversing through the work of Jesus. He is reversing it and bringing us back to a place where we're no longer against God. But God is for us. God is not against us. That's made it been very clear. But uh, God is for us. But it's time we said, and I want to be for God. Have you ever said that in your life? Have you ever knelt down and said to God, look, I'm here uh, not to just simply um, kneel down because of, uh, of uh, nations, I'm talking about all of nations, black, white, red, yellow, blue, any other color, that we don't bow the knee just for the sake of uh, the problems that are around us. We bow the knee to God, which is the source of our problem in the sense that when we are angry and when we are fighting and it all spills over and we say to one another, well, we'll have to fight because... The, We've had many fights to end all wars and this will be the war to finish all wars again. Well, how ridiculous can we become? We've done it again and again and again and we're still there. And I want to repeat that. It goes on in homes. It goes on in domestic relationships. It goes on in businesses. It goes on everywhere. And this anger and agitation is all from a frustration in the end. We do not want this God to reign over us. We want to get it, the chains off our backs. What a freedom, what a beauty it is when you've actually said to God, I don't want to keep on doing my will, I want your will to be done. Have you ever said it? If you haven't, say it this morning. Say it with somebody if you wish to make it more real to you because you can dream it and you can wish it but you can never actually to never get to the point where you do give yourself back to the one who made you. If he made you, you he, he, he owns you. If you make something, it belongs to you. And I want to say, Lord, I belong to you because that's how you made me. And as they worship God the creator here, they are deep down saying, we belong to you. You own us and we are going to live your way and in your world. That's the crux of a problem, a fundamental problem. It's very important for us to grasp it because you're going to, you meet lots of people, I'm sure, these days who are very proud that they're atheists. Have you come across this? You've met many people who are proud they're atheists. And um, you begin to wonder, well, what, what can I say to them? Well, you can say, uh, you 
belong to God because God made you. And they say, but I don't believe in God. You could reply a little bit sarcastically, you only don't believe in God because you can't be God yourself. If you could be, if you could be God, then you wouldn't be an atheist. You'd get on with it and you... Because the problem, this raging, this fury that goes on all the time, as I say, in any, in homes, in businesses, in nations, and then finally in wars, this agitation, this fury, the rage that burns in people's hearts, it simply comes from the one fundamental objection we have. We object to God. He who made us, we object to you. Why did you make us? We don't know. And you can live in that um, ig ignorance by saying, I'm an atheist. And it hopefully takes, a, you feel, a bit of the pressure off you. And this is a response, a proper uh, believer's response that has been available throughout all the centuries, whether it was Old Testament days or New Testament days, that we can get to the heart of this problem, get an answer, and see it subside. We simply come to the one that really deep down we're rebelling against and we bow the knee to him and say, we want your will done on earth. And that's the beauty of what worship really is about. This worship that joins us and glues us together is that whereby we've stopped the fight, stopped the antagonism, stopped the resistance, and we are laying down our arms against which we've been using to fight against the Lord. A lot of atheism is simply that. You won't lay down your arms so that you can come and receive a new sense of being and belonging to the Almighty himself. That's what worship is in essence. That's why we come together and worship. That's why we not only love it, it's, it's our very lifeblood. If we stop worshipping, we uh, are in the place where we're, we're trying to run the whole show ourselves and to get, bring any authority into other people's lives by reigning over them, to governing them, putting them down, controlling. And when you let go of all that, and you say, Lord, you control me instead. It's such a relief. You can take a breath again and you say, thank God it's over. I want to be on your side. Please say that to him this morning. It's your bounden duty. It is also an opportunity as you look at this text and see how wonderfully they worship together. Real worship is simply no longer fighting against God and trying to throw off his chains. He doesn't want you to walk around chained up. He just has to do it sometimes to keep us going at all because otherwise we destroy ourselves and everybody else with us. But that's where it begins in this text today. And as they start to worship as a company of people, Remembering this verse that belongs both to the old days and to the present day with Jesus, they say it once more. Um, the kings of the earth rise up. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. That's the anointed one, the Christ. So it's God and Christ. I just want to say what about these folk with these strange ideas like atheism or strange ideas that they make up themselves because often people say yes I'm not going to give my life to God I'm not going to start there I, I don't believe in him and I'm not going to believe in him I believe in myself and, my, and I'm going to examine the world and look at the world so closely that I shall come up with the solution. I will find within the world the answer to who I am, what I'm doing, why I'm here, and what is it, what's the point of being a human being? 
a part of God's cre a part of creation. When we ask these sort of questions and try to find out why on earth God made anyway, made the whole thing, we are starting to be a little bit more honest and admit that we don't know. But people have often tried to find a meaning for their existence, for their life, in examining and studying the universe, the things that God has made. He made the heavens, he made the sea, he made the stars, he made the, the dry land, as it says in that verse, verse 24. And while they're looking there, trying to find out and coming up with different answers because there are so many answers that are given, aren't there? <clears throat> um, so many, shall we say, thousands of this religion and so many thousands and millions of this religion. And there are lots of answers that people try to give. And they say, we've found this answer by examining the world. But the universe is what God has made. And by examining that, we do not find why he made it and what it's there for. We only find the reason by coming to the one who made it. There are lots of things that have been made, you've never known what they're there for unless the maker tells you. There are lots of things in our ele electronic age that... Um, I haven't a clue about them. I would never understand what they're all about anyway. Can't even manage my smartphone. I'm not smart enough, it seems. But I can't manage these things. Why? I could do if I go to somebody who made it and say, why did you make this thing and how does it function so I can use it or whatever. Which is what we're meant to do by going to God and saying, why did you make me and what, am, what do you want me to do? That is the very issue that people are getting angry and raging about. Nothing else really in the end, it's that. And so, as we try to understand, we come to the conclusion it's a God understanding that we need. The universe, by looking into all the atoms, by looking into the most distant galaxies, they don't give us the answer. What am I here for? What am I meant to be doing? Why is there so much suffering and so on? And they complain about it. But there's only one place to get the answer to those, those questions. It's by going to God himself and calling on the Lord as they were doing. And this is what we do when we worship. It's calling on the Lord and acknowledging if we're going to understand anything at all, it's going to be because God tells us God reveals it to us. Now, of course, we read the Bible because we believe God speaks to us there. But uh, prayer itself is an opening, giving God the opportunity to answer back and start to show us the way. Show me your way. As is at the heart of worship, and it's what we're doing when this morning we gather, we look forward to gathering once again and uh, knowing God at work, speaking to us and guiding us. And so God, if you like, um, is represented, sorry, the universe is represented by a circle and it's everything that God has made. It's everything that there is. And um, there are different ways in which Different philosophers have tried to answer this question. Why am I here? What should I be doing, etc.? And getting frustrated and angrier and angrier about it. It's interesting that um, I've quoted this before, but I'll say it again because I think it's so very succinct. It was in the last century, in the 20th century, not in the 21st, that... Uh, um, a philosopher called Wittgenstein, what else could he be with a name like that? Wittgenstein came up with uh, words to the effect that everything that is and that happens is meaningless 
unless there is something outside of everything that is and that happens, is outside of everything that happens, speaks or acts into everything that is and that happens. Now, have you got that? Looking at my watch, don't want to be too long. Everything that is and that happens, there's got to be something outside of it all that will speak into it in order that we can say there's a meaning to this. Otherwise, it's meaningless. It's exactly what the Bible says. God has subjected the universe without himself. He's subjected it to meaninglessness. Unless there is something outside who's going to speak to the inside. Got the idea? And that's why a lot of people live their whole life angry and raging and never getting a solution because they can't find out who they are, where they, what they're meant to be or where they're meant to be going. And yet God has said, it's, it's because I made it all and I'm outside it all that I can speak into it. And he can speak into it as we pray to him. He can speak into it as he did when he got into it all. This is the incredible thing about our God. He is not only a God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, verse 24, but he is the God who is the Christ who came into the things that he made as one who was made and has shown us what it's all about. And without him, we are left in the dark. It's empty and meaningless. No meaning for everything that happens. The thing that so many people complain about. Why should it happen to me and not him? This bad thing that happened, why, why, why me? Well, it's all meaningless. And the only way you can get any answer is by turning to God and calling upon him as they were doing on this particular day when uh, um, Peter and John were released and they joined their company and they all together cried out to God as they'd been doing in worship in order that they might hear from him. And this is the the message I want to leave with you this morning. There's a lot more here that we could have gathered. We could have thought a little bit more about um, the uh, pow power that comes in answer to prayer. They actually ask for signs. They ask for healings. There are people today, there are, you'll meet some who call, who call themselves Christians, but they say, you, you, well, you you shouldn't ask for God to heal because he's not going to intervene and interrupt. He is an intervening, interrupting God. And in the Bible here, the apostles, they asked for more healings, didn't they? Send healings and give us boldness. I believe we need these two things. Are you listening? I don't want to add too much more to what I've said because you'll forget one or the other. We do need to be praying, and uh, I could have given lots of illustrations about healings today, but we need to get back to expecting God to heal when we pray and when we call upon him. He didn't make us to be those who suffer. He made us to solve this raging suffering that comes upon the world and to stop all the rioting and all the things that go with it. He made us to be a people who can say that we have heard and that we believe and we're trusting him. Without trust, without faith in him, there is no way that we're going to find a way forward. In this um, story that goes on, you will see that there's, they pray, they praise, and then they start preaching to one another, speaking the word of God with boldness. And, uh, and then 
the answer to their cry, not only for healings, but miracles, is that God decides to give them a shake-up. And there was uh, a shaking in the house. Do you like a shake-up when you wake up? God shakes us up to wake us up. That was a release of God's power, which was full of meaning. It was full of, I'm answering your cry for miracles. My power is what does miracles. Here it is. And it's a reminder, too, that we didn't make ourselves, which is always a good reminder. So we don't belong to ourselves, we belong to him. When people talk about, well, um, I, I've got a right to do what I like with my body. You haven't. I haven't. Nobody has. We've only got a right to do what God intended, what God made it for. So here we are with terrifically deep truths in just a simple thing that happened. The law court seen a threat and then a release and a company of believers to go to and out of that flows Praise, worship, power released, and a reminder that we need to continue on with God, who is the source of all power, that we might be who we were meant to be. And they were all filled with the Spirit. That was the result. Call upon the Lord, one, to tell him that he is your God, two, Ask him to send his spirit and fill you as you acknowledge God and his Christ who died for you. What a wonderful thing it is to have a God who is understandable and begins to answer these deep problems and questions in many of our lives, especially those of us who are conscious that we've been raging about this, that or the other recently. The heart of it is, call upon the Lord and you will be saved from whatever it is you're trying to get out of.